My name uh, is Bruce Kane, and I'm the Spence and Cleone Eccles Family Director for the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And I had to practice that a lot uh, to get it down. Um, for those of you who don't know the Lane Center, we were founded in 2005 uh, by the publishers of Sunset Magazine. Uh, the Lane Center takes an interdisciplinary approach uh, to the study of the West, exploring the past, present, and future of the American West. Uh, the State of the West is a special collaboration that we've had for a number of years now with CEPR, as Mark explained earlier. And tonight, I'm pleased to be joined on stage by the Honorable Brian Sandoval, uh, the governor of the great state of Nevada. Now, Governor Sandoval was elected to the as the 30th governor of Nevada in 2010, and then re-elected in 2014. Uh, prior to serving as governor, he was the uh, US uh, district judge for the District of Nevada. And he also served as the Attorney General for Nevada and the Chairman of the Nevada Gaming Commission and was a member of the Nevada Legislature. Uh, in his final month of office, we are delighted to welcome uh, Governor Sandoval back to Stanford. He was here, I think, four years ago for the State of the West Symposium. So please join me in welcoming Governor Sandoval. So the governor uh, has opted to live dangerously and do uh -huh. Q&A for the entire session. So uh, you can do that when you only have oh, a month to go, right? Exactly. So <laughs> save up all those tough questions uh, for dessert. Um, and in the meantime, I will get him warmed up with uh, some questions that are on the theme, at least, uh, that we thought of this session, and that being banks and infrastructure following on Randy's excellent presentation about rural banks. So let's talk a little bit about rural uh, infrastructure. And uh, if we take you back to when you assumed uh, the head of the uh, Western uh, or the National Governors Association, you, um, you, you took on an initiative called the Head of the Curve. So talk a little bit about what was in your mind when you took on that initiative and what you were trying to do. Okay. First, Bruce, thank you everyone for having me. It really is a privilege and honor to be here at Stanford, in fact, it's, it's humbling. And when I received the invitation, I was really excited to be able to come back because I did enjoy my experience uh, four years ago. And so it is a pleasure to be here. But I, I did have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the National Governors Association. And as the chairman, you have the opportunity to choose your initiative. And I chose ahead of the curve. And what one of the reasons, and I think we'll get into this during our conversation is, it's what I call the new Nevada, and it's something that I talked about in my state of the state, that we were an economy that was hit harder than any other state in the union. Eight years ago, if I was sitting here, we'd have, we had 14% unemployment, 175,000 Nevadans had lost their jobs. We led the country as well in foreclosures, bankruptcies, 80% of the homes were, were underwater. When I stepped into office, eight years ago to, to now, we had a $2 billion budget deficit on a $6 billion uh, or budget. So we were in really difficult times. And one of the things that I ran on and I talked about during my first day of the state was diversifying our economy, but more importantly, diversifying it into the new, the new economy and getting at the forefront of what some people have called the fourth industrial revolution associated with advanced manufacturing, technology, the autonomous vehicles, all those things. And so we'll get into it in the course of our conversation, but we've had a lot of success in our state with regard to those types of companies. And one of the things I realized was there were a lot of changes that needed to be made within Nevada to be able to accommodate all those new employees and those new companies that were coming to our state with regard to infrastructure, workforce, regulations, et cetera. <clears throat> So it was kind of a learn and do on the fly. But I wanted the other governors to have the benefit of what we learned in Nevada because this isn't just a Nevada-specific issue. This is a U.S. issue. And so that was the purpose for the head of the curve. Um, it did focus on energy and transportation. We couldn't do everything. Uh, but, but in any event, um, I thought it was important to inform the other governors. I think 
many governors are risk averse. You know, they don't want to take some chances or get into these, these new areas for fear of what perhaps the public backlash could be. So I wanted to help them along that way. So that was essentially the, the Reader's Digest version of the basis of choosing that. But, you know, infrastructure is one of these issues that seems to have bipartisan support. And at the national level, it seemed like both the Democrats and uh, President Trump were interested in doing infrastructure. But it was still born. It didn't come out of the national government yet. So here you are. You're in, you inherit a state that has some financial problems because of uh, what happened in the housing crisis. And, and, and yet you're taking on something which takes an enormous amount of money and uh, really pays benefits into the future. So how does the state get into the infrastructure business? How do you even get it started? Well, we, um, I mean, it, I guess, goes back to taking some risks. I mean, with, right now, with regard to infrastructure, we're building the largest public works project in the history of Nevada. It's called Project Neon in Las Vegas. And we are completely... Um, restructuring and modernizing the main artery in Las Vegas with regard to where the Interstate 5 and 95 meet. But um, we're also updating technologically our highway and our infrastructure system because I'm anticipating you know, huge growth in electric vehicles. So we're going to elect what we call electrify all our, our highways so that there are charging stations no matter where you are in Nevada. I mean, we have the loneliest road in America, but uh, we do, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, but um, we're starting with the highway between Reno and Las Vegas. But you know, in my conversations with Elon Musk and what I've learned is that there, there are gonna be a, a huge proliferation of, of EVs, electric vehicles. And if you don't have your state positioned to prepare for that, but I do get some backlash because there aren't a lot of EVs right now in our state. Um, but you know you have to look five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years into the future. The other thing are autonomous vehicles, and I think we're gonna talk about that in a little bit as well. Obviously, that's in its infancy, but you have to have the smart city and the smart grids in, our, in order to operate the, the autonomous vehicles. If you go to Las Vegas today, you can get in, in an autonomous cab. There is a driver in there, but um, it's Aptiv has, I believe, two to 300 vehicles there, and you'll see them all over Las Vegas. That's something else that doesn't happen overnight. We were the first state to adopt regulations that allowed for the testing and operation of autonomous vehicles. I was actually the first governor in the country to ride in an autonomous car, and this was way back in 2012. It was the Google car. We're in Carson City, and we rode out, and went about five miles out and five miles back, and there's a little hill that if you've ever been on there to go into Carson City, and I must admit, at 70 miles an hour, my toes were, were curled up. Um, <laughs> and I, we pulled into the DMV, and I said, uh, I can't believe you let me behind the wheel, because they actually let me behind the wheel, and they looked at me and said, we can't believe you did. <laughs> 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 but, in, but in any event, I have tried to be a governor in position our state at the forefront of all these new technologies, but at the same time, you have to have the regulations and the infrastructure to match, which gets me back to your first question, is to ahead of the curve. As governors, we have to be ahead of the curve, and as governors, we have the ability to walk into our offices every day and adopt and implement regulations and policy immediately to allow that to happen. Right. So, I mean, you can have infrastructure that is broken and needs to be repaired, and then there's infrastructure that you build because you're anticipating something. Uh, was yours largely on the premise that you were trying to encourage more growth in Nevada, or were there pieces of infrastructure, bridges, uh, other things that needed to be fixed? Well, and if so, how do you finance all that? Well, it's a, it's a combination of, of many things. And so, you know, Every state has maintenance issues, and, and for us, because we have so many wide open highways, um, you know that that's a constant struggle. But we also knew that you know we're the fastest. Las Vegas, Clark County, is one of the fastest growing counties in the country. There, it's adding five thousand people a month uh, right now. And so, again, you have to get um, anticipate and get get a, get ahead of the curve. But um, 
in Reno, uh, the, the problem we're having now, um, and we'll talk about the Tesla Gigafactory. Uh, right now it employs over 7,000 people. It is 5 million square feet. When it's finished, it will be the largest building on planet Earth. Uh, I just had a, a um, tech summit with, with Elon out there and, and some other folks. He anticipates that, that it will be somewhere when it's finished 10 to 15 million square feet and it will employ close to fit or between 15 and 20,000 people right down the road from it is a data center which will be the largest data center on on planet earth switch there's another company blockchains that just purchased 70,000 acres out there and intends to build a blockchain campus uh, that will employ 20,000 people google has purchased 3,000 acres out there uh, and will be you know, they, I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do, but they just announced they're building an $800 million data center in southern Nevada, but they have these 3,000 acres. But the point being, there's so many employees coming in and out of there that we didn't anticipate that traffic is queuing on the interstate, on what was once a rural exit where there was no issues. So we have to be able to find the money to be able to build that. How do we fund it? We, you know, we bond. And with that project NEON in Southern Nevada, that was a billion dollar plus project. What we did was a design build. And so the, the contractor, came, well, we, had, we put an RFP out there. We had three contractors who bid on it and we took the lowest one. But in, but in any event, we saved a lot of money by, by doing it that way. So the transportation is tied to the employment growth and the population growth, which then puts more demand on other aspects of your infrastructure. And in particular, a distinctive infrastructure problem we have is water. Getting water, you know, move, conveying water, cleaning water. Uh, so what does this mean, uh, the growth of your state? Where, where do you see water coming? And uh, <laughs> is it sufficient to meet the kind of uh, dreams that you have for the population growth in Nevada? Well, and that's a very complicated question because there are different basins in our state. There's the Colorado River Basin, which is Las Vegas, and in northern Nevada, it's a completely different basin. Jim Ogsbury is here, who is the executive director of the Western Governors Association. Four years ago when I was here, my issue was drought, and this was right on the heels of Nevada and, and California, but we had 5% of our regular precipitation. I did a press conference in the middle of a dry lake that right now is under 12 feet of 15 feet of water but um, literally it was at the you know in the middle of, of a, a dry area so there were a lot of issues associated with that water and then the very next year we had 300 percent of our regular precipitation which one of our reservoirs which holds 600,000 acre feet we essentially had to empty it out into the desert two times over <laughs> so that a small rural community called Fallon, Nevada, which, by the way, I lived when I was a little boy, would have been under four feet of water. Mm -hmm. So to get to your question, you know, water has always been a, a huge issue. Right now it's particularly acute in southern Nevada because Lake Mead is at its lowest level and it's lo it, it can't go any lower, fortunately, because it, it's at, at its lowest legal level. But the Southern Nevada Water Authority has had to invest over a billion dollars to build what we call a third straw. So they had to literally build a new intake that went below the depth of the lake to ensure an adequate water supply for Las Vegas. But here's the thing about Las Vegas. And many of you may or may not know this. Las Vegas actually uses less water now than it did 30 years ago because it is the most efficient water system in the country. It has less than a 5% leakage rate. But, it, but in any event, they are having to do those types of conservation matters to ensure a water supply for Southern Nevada. But um, I know we're going to get into climate change, but this is a big issue for us. And so there are constant negotiations that are going on between Arizona, between California, between Colorado, all the constituencies on the Colorado River in order to ensure adequate water. When all those rules and regulations were put into place, this country, or Western, the Western U.S. was a very, very different place with different, I mean, Las Vegas might have had 50,000 people at the time. It has 2 million people as we speak now. And as I mentioned, it is the fastest growing um, uh, urban area in the country. 
But uh, I guess, again, getting to the nut of your question, we do have an adequate water supply there. Similarly, in northern Nevada, water is, um, is something that we have to watch very closely. Um, as part of that drought initiative, um, we, we changed some of the laws with regard to what's called prior appropriation. So in other words, people, if they weren't using their water, they'd lose it. But then we were telling people not to use their water because there was a drought. So you kind of have to balance those types of policy issues. But um, as we speak right now, I mean, it, we, that's why I woke up this morning and there were six inches of snow in my front yard in Reno. And I was very happy because um, I don't want to go through what we went through four years ago with 5% of, of our water. Right. Well, I mean, and part of it, of course, is that with the climate change, there's going to be less storage in the, in the Sierras. And, uh, and so we have to find new ways to store. And, and there's more demand of, of other cities on the Colorado River. So it sounds like there's going, is there any effort to sort of limit the growth in southern uh, Nevada, uh, according to what your expectations of water are? Not right now. Yeah. Not right now. I mean, and everyone likes to point to the casinos. So the casinos are the least you know, use the least amount of, of the water down there. But um, it's the golf courses and the water in the lawns. That's where most of the water use comes. The water, the, the casinos are, are actually some of the most efficient users uh, of the water there. But right now, no. I mean, it's, and, and we do feel that we have a, an adequate water, water supply. Is California a good neighbor to Nevada? Love California. <laughs> Now, I ask him this question because he is a California native. Yes. He was born in California. I was born in Redding, he California. Can, yes. so, uh, <laughs> so are we good neighbors? Yes. No, and, and I will say this. I want to compliment your current governor. And Governor Brown and I work very closely together we, when it comes to wildfires. When Nevada has these hellacious wildfires, literally, I have spoken with Governor Brown, and he has... Um, sent us assets and resources you know, for your fires that you've recently experienced, which are unimaginable um, given the urban interface that, and, and the victims and the families have been affected by all that. We sent our National Guard, we sent our helicopters, we sent several of our crews over there to help out. So um, we've cooperated very well in that, in, in that area. Lake Tahoe is another place. We have a Tahoe Forum every year where the California U.S. Um, senators and the Nevada senators and each of the governors meet. We meet at Lake Tahoe and talk about ways that we can preserve the lake and preserve its clarity and be good uh, forest managers, those types of things. So Governor Brown and I have really collaborated well. So we're perfect neighbors. You have no complaints. <laughs> Come on, you can tell <laughs> us. <laughs> no, I I really can't think, I, you know, think of anything derogatory to say and you know frankly we love Californians because they come and are tourists in uh, <laughs> in Nevada um, so uh, and we did take the Raiders I don't know if there are any Raider fans in here but if you drive to Las Vegas now the Raider Stadium is a third done it will be likely the <laughs> must be a lot of 49er fans in here but uh, yeah but um, no, it's exciting for, for Las Vegas. But there is a kind of inherent uh, tension in the region between states competing with one another for businesses. Oh, undoubtedly. And to get these businesses, you're giving you know, tax breaks and subsidies and building infrastructure. And so there is a kind of comp competition. Uh, is the main competition with California or with other states or what? Yeah, I'll, and again, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible. So amongst um, many of my responsibilities, um, one of my first initiatives, what we talked about in 2011, um, historically in Nevada, economic development was within the province of the lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, I sponsored a bill that brought it within the governor's office because I felt like if I was going to diversify our economy, I needed to be the one who was in charge of it or the governor needed to be in charge of it. So we elevated economic development to the governor's office. We created the governor's office of economic development. We created a board of which I chair. So every month we have companies that are seeking those abatements and we can get into, into that conversation with regard to the tax abatements or perhaps tax credits. But um, I'll just tell you, there are many California companies that are coming to Nevada. And they come, the primary reason that we, 
that they explain when they come before our, our board is affordability, yeah. that their employees can no longer afford to buy a house. They have to commute an hour, two hours to get to work. They're struggling. Um, and there's a regulatory, a different regulatory environment. There's much more access in Nevada because we, you know, we're still a small enough state that, that that can happen. So we have had, you know, no major, major companies that are uprooting, but we've had a lot of mid to smaller level companies, two to 300 employees that are literally moving their entire corporate headquarters and moving them to Nevada, which we obviously welcome, welcome them. These are technology companies. These are good paying jobs um, that, that average $30, $40 an hour, which you can afford to buy a house and make it a, a decent living. So yes, we've had um, some success with regard to bringing companies from here to California, but I Never, never, because I don't think that's the way to, to operate, say anything derogatory about California or any other state. We do compete with, with other states, Texas, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, for the companies that have announced that they're going to leave. But um, we leave it up to the, the head of that company or whoever represents them to make that decision. Now, uh, another part of that, of course, uh, people, when they move to a state, they look at the, the, you know, the lifestyle and... Uh, and one of the things that people look at, of course, is the healthcare situation. And you famously have sort of split from uh, the Republican Party and the administration over uh, the ACA. So talk a little bit about why you did that, because obviously that was politically uh, brave and you know potentially damaging thing to do. Even though your popularity didn't suffer, you were still very popular. But obviously tying with the party network was a consideration. So talk, walk, walk us through how you make a decision like that and, and, uh, and, and why you thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, it was a monumental decision, and you have to put yourself back, I think it was six years ago, um, in, in that environment. But I will tell you, any decision I make as governor, I always put Nevada first. It's not about ideology. It's not about party. It's what, what's in the best interests of our state. At the time, Nevada had an uninsured rate, I believe, of 22, 23%. I think we were, if not the worst in the country, one of the worst. Uh, we had just had a behavioral health, a mental health um, crisis. And, you know, having done, when I did my due diligence, um, one of the things that I discovered is that um, single childless adults are covered by the ACA, which would include coverage for a lot of people that had behavioral health issues. But um, so from a humane standpoint, it was a no-brainer. I mean, there are 200,000 more people that now have health care that were getting their health care in the emergency room. And so now um, they have that health care. The other thing I did was um, put all of those new enrollees, everyone but the ABD, the Age Blind or Disabled, in managed care. And so that was something that... Um, I think really Im improve the system. We now get close to $2 billion of more money in our healthcare system as a result. So we had a public hospital in Las Vegas, the U UMC University Medical Center that was 50 to $100 million in the red and now is in the black and is doing quite well. They had a queuing of over 200 people in their emergency room on a, a daily basis, most of whom were individuals that, that were in a mental health crisis, and now they're not in those emergency rooms. So now it may, may be a few dozen, if that. Um, one of the other things that I did is, at the time, Secretary Burwell, um, Sylvia Burwell was the, the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services. We negotiated, or I negotiated with her, increasing the daily rate from $300 to $900 a day, which opened up literally thousands of new beds and the private hospitals building wings dedicated to, to uh, behavioral health or, or, or mental health. So, you know, it can always be better, um, but it's been really beneficial to our state um, for people to have that coverage. We did have a challenge a couple years ago in, in rural Nevada. So in Nevada, we obviously have two distinct urban areas, Las Vegas and the Reno area, and 10% of the population lives in the rest and the providers in those rural counties all pulled out 
and so there was not going to be a provider out there. So I was able to negotiate um, with a company to, to stay, and that really saved that. But um, some of the reimbursements and things are a challenge out there in, in the rural counties and getting providers out there, getting doctors, getting nurses. You know, nobody wants to live in Tonopah, Nevada, if any of you have heard of Tonopah. But, um, and I love Tonopah because I know this is being recorded. But, um, <laughs> but I'm just saying there's some people who don't want to live in a very remote town with less than a thousand people, but these people need to have care. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that the 2016 election really made clear that may not have been as obvious to people, which is that this divide between urban-suburban versus rural and that the plight of health care, the plight of lack of job opportunities, the obesity, the drug abuse issues that are pervasive in rural areas of America and especially in the West, um, really that divide has gotten much greater in, in ways that I don't think people, both parties, know really didn't pay enough attention to. So talk a little bit, of, uh, you don't have as much of a rural area because you're highly urbanized uh, around two centers, but you have enough of it to know that there are problems there. So aside from healthcare, what else can you do in those areas on issues of obesity and, uh, and job opportunities, et cetera? Well, that's one of the, the challenges when you, when you talk about jobs. I get letters from urban, or excuse me, rural mayors saying, what about us? You brought Tesla to, to northern Nevada, you brought Apple to, to northern Nevada, you brought Google to northern Nevada, you brought Google to, to southern Nevada, you know, what about us? And there are just so many different challenges. Healthcare is a challenge. Internet access, something that we all take for granted here. Some of these towns don't have, I mean, they're literally using dial-up. And you're not going to bring a company to a rural area if, if there isn't adequate, um, adequate access to, to the internet. There's a little town, uh, you know, the, the education system. They don't have the resources, and that's something else we can talk about. That's, you know, why I raised a tax so we could properly fund K through 12 education in in the, in in our state, but particularly in some of the rural areas. But those, you know, we could talk about the opioid crisis and making sure that we have the proper resources for that as well. These are all things that are. There's just not one single issue that. Um, that uh, we can focus on. So I guess, again, trying to be responsive to your question is I really try to ensure as governor to do the best that I can that the rural counties, the rural communities have the same opportunities that anybody who lives in the urban areas. Right. Um, does the topic of sort of the, the divide between conditions in rural areas and urban, suburban areas, um, does that come up in, uh, say, Western Governors Association meetings? Uh, and are, are people exchanging ideas about how to deal with it, best practices? Of course we are. And Jim's here, and, but I love the Western Governors Association. It really is an opportunity. It, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. We've all heard that. And when I find out that there's something going on in Montana, Arizona, California, I see, and it's working, I'll see if we can adopt it in our state. But um, you know, back to the rural communities, one of the things that I did in our state is I created some categorical funding. We created what are called Zoom schools and Victory schools. The Victory schools were schools that have 50% or more English language learners. Mm -hmm. So in some of these rural communities, you really had some high population of English language learners. And then the, the Victory schools were the 20 poor zip codes in the state. And those students, we, we gave them more money. So, for example, there's a little town on the, in Nevada on the northern border, on the Idaho border with Nevada. It's a Waihe, Nevada. And it has a 90-plus percent Native American population. And it had, I think, a graduation rate of 20%. And it became eligible um, as a victory school and allowed it to get more funding and get some devices. Some, it was a novel thing for them to have an iPad in their classroom. So we, we were able to fund so that some of those schools, again, could have some of the um, technology and, and the devices that the, the urban urban ones had. So it's been really you know, a lot of work, and it's very expensive <laughs> to be able to do all those things. But that's part of 
you know, again, how these things are all inextricably intertwined. When you're creating a bigger tax base, you're able to create more money to be able to fund these things so that you can benefit all the people of your state. So I'm going to go out to the audience for questions in a second. I've got to ask a couple political questions as a political scientist mm -hmm. here. Uh, but then I'm going to go out. So hold on a second, OK? Uh, so the political question I want to ask you is, what's happening politically in the West? Uh, and that is, this last election, you saw Democrats winning in Arizona, winning in New Mexico, winning, if we go all the way to the 100th Meridian in Oklahoma City, winning in Utah. So. And if you look at the pattern, there's kind of a red-blue pattern emerging. So what's happening in Nevada? What's happening in the interior? It used to be we said, OK, there were the three Pacific Coast states that were very blue. And then there was the sort of red interior west. But it seems like it's getting more complicated. Is that your view, too? It is. And if, if any of you watched what happened in Nevada, um, the Republican candidate literally had on his campaign signs, protect Nevada. <laughs> and he would give his stump speech, stump speech, excuse me, included all these Californians are moving to Nevada and turning the state blue. And, you know, that, that was his mantra. So, you know, it was an interesting lesson, and I'm sure you're going to be, be studying that. But at least in, in Nevada, from, if you look at this election, is that um, it is going? It definitely gone purple and going blue, but I think a lot of it still. We're a small state, and a lot of it has to do with your candidates. And four years ago, um, when I was on the top of the ticket, every constitutional officer was a Republican, and both houses of the legislature turned Republican for the first time in a generation. So, um, but at least in this election cycle, you you see, you know, you saw what what happened. And, uh, you know, I guess you can point to what's happening nationally. I know that our, our Republican, and both our U.S. Senators are Democrats as well. The Republican in, incumbent lost his race to a one-term congresswoman. But they all um, you know, essentially tied themselves to the president. The president came to Nevada several times. And so I think it was a, an interesting study that, again, I think you'll, you, you'll look at. But at least as we sit here now, Nevada is a purple state at best. OK, so let's unleash the audience here. And uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. So uh, I'd let you guys just pick. Uh, yeah. Make, wait for the mic, please. Uh, and you yeah. A large percentage of the land in Nevada belongs to the federal government. How does that affect the way that you run the state? How did it affect how I run the state? So just for everybody's. Um, Edification, Nevada is 86% federal land. And if you, you, if you looked at a heat map, <laughs> the only places that aren't federal land are along the highways and the railroads and in Reno and Las Vegas and in Carson City. So it's really important as governor that, um, that I work closely with the, the federal government, particularly the Department of Interior and the Bureau of, of Land Management and the Department of Energy. Here's an example. So as you know, um, there's an effort to locate high-level nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain in southern Nevada. And I have been a, an unapologetic op you know, opposed to that because I don't think that it can safely geologically isolate the waste. But more, more recently, there, um, we were advised that the, the Department of Energy was going to move plutonium from South Carolina because it was found that it was unsafe to store it there, so they wanted to put it in our state. And <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. No, exactly. But um, So they, they found it was so unsafe that they couldn't store it there, but it's okay to put it in Nevada and, and literally bury it in the desert. And so it, Secretary Perry is a friend and somebody that um, actually supported me in my first run for governor, but um, you know, we talked about this. My staff interacted with them, and we didn't get the. Um, you know, I, I wanted some some environmental studies done. We didn't know the degree of you know how how strong that waste was. Where it is on the continuum? Is it closer to the high level nuclear waste? Where is it? Uh, but in any event, we couldn't get any of those answers, so I had to file a lawsuit or the. 
I, advise, I instructed the attorney general to file a lawsuit and we get into litigation. Depending on who the administration is, we are constantly fighting about Yucca Mountain. So President Clinton and President Obama defunded uh, the um, Yucca Mountain site. Uh, President uh, Trump has put a minimal amount, $100 million, to begin the licensing process. But this has been a something that's been going on since the 80s, since I was the attorney general, since I was in, in the legislature. But again, to get to, to your question, it's really important for a governor to establish relationships with the cabinet secretaries because it is more acute in our state given that we're 86% federal land. Let's go to different sides of the room. So let's I'm take a question. Curious. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Always wait for the mic. Yeah. Um, there you go. I'm curious about uh, homelessness in your state. Actually, it works if you put the mic near your mouth. Yeah. There you go. I'm curious <laughs> about homelessness in the uh, state of Nevada and uh, how many homeless people you've been able to document and uh, what measures you've uh, worked on to deal with these uh, issues. All right. So I, I don't know, I don't have a, a figure, but I, I will tell you one of the things that I did is something that I've already talked about with regard to opting in on the Affordable Care Act. We know that the homeless, most of, of them have mental health issues. And what was happening is they would go to the emergency room or what have you, they would get their one week or one month worth of meds and then they'd fall off and then they'd be back into homelessness. So now, as I mentioned, we have, as a result of the Affordable Care Act and my uh, making single childless adults eligible for the affordable or eligible for health care, they're now getting that care. The other thing that uh, it's interesting that you, you brought that up, but in both northern and southern Nevada, there are mental health campuses. And we have worked closely with the local governments. And the, we have essentially given open-ended leases to the local governments to be able to provide housing for um, homeless home, people who are homeless uh, and give them the ability to have a place to reside and get up and off their feet and be able to, to find a job and get some stability. You're never going to, there are some people that are homeless that just don't want to be managed. They're, um, and that's always a struggle and a challenge. But I guess those are two examples of where I've made policy decisions that have directly addressed the situation. Okay, let's go back over to this side. Wait, wait for the mic, yeah. This is not a question about Nevada per se. It's a question from the perspective of a governor who is leaving office and turning the governorship over to someone else. Can you comment on what's happening in Wisconsin right now? Uh, you know, I... It wouldn't happen in Nevada. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you how I'm doing it. So there's a Democratic, the Democratic, the Democrat won the race. Um, we reached out to both candidates a month before the election even happened and said, you know, let us know who your transition person is. We've emptied offices in the Capitol to make it available to you. I actually build the budget in Nevada. So we meet only every other year. And so we have a biannual uh, budget, but which is about 90% done. We're meeting with their staff, the incoming, the governor-elect staff, as we speak. I even just had, I was explaining to, to Bruce what I called the governor's conclave, so I invited all the living governors and the governor-elect to have a dinner so that we could all meet and talk about, you know, different stories and how they managed through different crises. It, it, that would not have happened in Nevada because we'd only meet every other year. Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it well, could not have happened. I'll just say it's not something I would have done. Um, and, you know, the worm always turns. Yeah. <laughs> and usually, you know, it, you know, if you try to do something like that later on, it, it comes back. And it's just not, a, you know, the way I would govern. Let's just put it that way. Okay, over here. Uh, how about way over on the table here? I'm interested in... Um, given the Foxcom subsidies that look to be excessive, 
what is your experience with Tesla? Because, of course, you did give them quite a bit of incentives to come there, and obviously they're growing, but have you actually figured out whether your forecasts were reasonably accurate? Yes. So we, um, in fact, um, I think it's online. There's some stories that, that you can read right now. We just, uh, bottom line, they have exceeded everything they said they were going to do. They're employing more people. They've invested more money. They've created uh, more construction jobs. It's been a massive winner for us. So we, yes, and you know, we can get into the debate about the incentives in, in the abatements, and I have this on an ongoing basis. We're still collecting tax money, <laughs> and it, uh, but we're not collecting as much as we would have. But in, in the meantime, you know, there's 7,000 direct jobs. I think um, what I saw, if my memory serves me right, is there are over 30,000 indirect jobs, and the amount of economic benefit that we're getting is far ahead of what we thought it was, was going to be. So yes, you know, we had to compete and that's, as a governor, you have to work in the real world and you cannot provide abatements and you cannot provide incentives and you don't get anything. You get nothing. And this, that Tesla factory, they called it the Tesla effect in Northern Nevada has transformed, you know, what's happening out there with Panasonic and, and the data centers that, that I talked about before, and it's completely remaking the economy, the base in, in Northern Nevada. So, you know, it was a big risk for me. I had to go out on a huge political limb. I had to call a special session of the legislature. I mentioned that we only meet every other year. I had to call a special session of the legislature to create a new category of abatements in order for them to come, for Tesla to come. But frankly, we were a fraction of what other states were offering. I mean, the benefit of Nevada was that they could get a, a, a building permit within 30 days. Whereas, if you know, I'm just told this anecdotally, if they had come to California, it would have taken two years. And they needed to start building. And they needed to start producing those batteries. So it's, it's been transformative for our state. But... I definitely have my critics, but I think that um, most people understand and realize that it, it, it was great for us. But yeah, I would, again, go online because you'll see that report and you'll see that they've exceeded what they said they were going to do. Okay, let's go back over on this side again. Um, Pat, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in the West and uh, Montana and Wyoming and Utah. Got my first gun when I was seven. And yet I also watched the Las Vegas shooting and I wonder, as the governor of that state, what your thoughts are about trying to at least have some influence or curtailment of that kind of rampage. Well, first, you know, I hope for anybody's benefit and anybody who's in public service, anybody, that nobody has to go through that. I, that has taken something out of me that I will never put back. I mean, that is the, the phone call as a governor or, that you never want to get, and I still will never, I was in the mansion reading, and I got that phone call at 10 o'clock that night, and, you know, the, you know, the reports that I was getting, and, and, uh, and then going there the next morning, and walking through where there were still bodies out there, going to the hospital, and talking to the families, uh, talking to the um, first responders, law enforcement, the firefighters, going to the coroner's office where they literally had to bring in a tr refrigeration truck because there were so many bodies there. Um, I mean, I, 58 that were killed, um, over 500 that were, you know, were injured, and then thousands upon thousands that um, have been affected mentally by that. We have expended millions of dollars, and most of whom were Californians. Frankly, I think they, they estimated there were 12,000 Californians that, that attended that. So we're, we as Nevada, and I've told them, it is not just the, it is the right thing to do to be able to find, uh, provide that victim compensation, even if they're California residents. So we are providing that, you know, th those resources for, for, the, for the Californians. Yeah, in terms of um, what, what can I do? If I had another term, I'd ban the bump stock. Um, 
the bump stock was what allowed him. Uh, the other thing that I did was um, we now require all the, the properties to provide to the Gaming Control Board essentially a layout of the property. Um, we've implemented more safety procedures. So now if you go, I was just at the wind, there's a dog, sniffing dog uh, at, the, at the elevators. But he did purchase all those guns legally. And um, so no matter where he would have done that, I mean, the, you know, the one thing they'll never figure out, what we still don't know is why. There was, there was nothing that would have indicated he was a known player in Nevada, both in Reno and in Las Vegas. He had a line of credit at the Wynn. He had a line of credit at the MGM. He had a line of credit at Caesars. He had never indicated or shown any type of violence. He had never been adjudicated mentally ill. So there was nothing that would have indicated that he was capable of doing what he did. But we have tried, or we have tried, not just tried, we have implemented, I think, more procedures um, to, to ensure the safety of, of the patrons. There are 42 million people a year come to Las Vegas alone. Over 52 million people come to Nevada. So I think it's, um, it's gonna, going to be incumbent upon the gaming industry for us to, to learn from that, to, to make sure that all the policies and procedures are in, in place. I am, one of my responsibilities after I leave the, go the governor's office is I'm going to be leading a committee and working with the victims so that we can put together an appropriate memorial for that. That's something that doesn't happen overnight. But uh, again, with regard to the guns, that's the question. That would be something that would have to be done federally. No. Okay, let's go back over here. Uh, let's go to Chris Field. Yeah. Thank you. you. You promised earlier that you would say a few words about climate change. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what Nevada has done and should do to prepare for climate change. Well, in you know, that's... I want to take action. So... One of the things, you know, we talked, I think we were talking about it at the reception. I signed a net metering bills that allowed for the proliferation of rooftop solar in our state. Um, we have used incentives. So I believe in Nevada, um, we have installed close to $8 billion of renewable energy projects in our, in our state. I've signed legislation that will close two coal powered plants in, uh, in Southern Nevada and will replace them with uh, renewable energy. Um, so I, you know, Nevada, we, when we, um, when there were those new regulations that were, were put out by the EPA, Nevada was already in compliance. So we, um, you know, I've worked really hard. I, you know, we have the assets to be a real clean energy um, leader. In full disclosure, I did veto uh, an RPS bill that would have increased the renewable portfolio standard in, in Nevada to 50%. But that was also um, along with where we had a ballot question that would allow for energy choice in our state. And I wasn't sure what effect that would have. And you know, the thing again, I'm, you know, with regard to California, you guys produce so much renewable energy that you also, you actually pay Nevada to take it. Yes. <laughs> so our, you pay our utility to take your ec excess um, solar energy that's produced during the day. Now, the batteries and what's happening at Tesla is gonna, going to help with that, but I didn't want to increase our RPS to the, to the point where we were producing so much renewable energy that we couldn't use it all. So I tr was trying to find a balance. We already do have a 25% renewable portfolio standard and I'd like to see that stepped up but I thought 50% was too big a too big of a jump but um, I think the combination of all those things has been uh, responsive to, to climate change and I think that I can say in very good conscience that Nevada has done its part okay let's go back over on this side again So I'm on the faculty of civil and environmental engineering and head of the new Smart Cities Research Center here. And so your political leadership on smart cities and autonomous vehicles is very much recognized. Thank you for that. Um, my question is, if you were Gavin Newsom, 
How would hmm. you think about high-speed rail going forward in California? Nice, easy question. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to avoid that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, there for years, they, you know, there's been a desire to build high-speed rail between Las Vegas and, and L.A. And there never was enough money. There's a Florida company, and I can't recall um, its name. You probably know it, that has purchased. And I am told it's going to be, be real. I don't know if it's going to terminate in Victorville, which, you know, has been another debate. Is, is anybody going to ride a train to Victorville and figure, <laughs> and figure out how to get, you know, from the other station? I can't recall the community where it's going to be, which where they want it to actually terminate, but I'm told that the, the money is there to build this. And, you know, I think there's got to be some type of demonstration project. I think yours is going to go from San Francisco to Fresno <laughs> to the to, to Southern San Jose, yeah. <laughs> something, something like that. I mean, I don't know. I've ridden the, the, the high-speed rail in Germany and in Japan and China, and it works great. I just don't know if too much infrastructure has grown around that, that makes it so that um, you know it, it can pay for itself. So it's just really difficult to redo the infrastructure and, and, and make it so that you get the proper ROI, return on investment, to, to make it realistic. But at the same time, you know, I was in Southern California, and you guys are saturated. There's, there is no more room for any more cars. There's, so it's a really difficult question, but maybe you, you, know, you, you find some type of pilot project or pilot pilot route to see if it's really doable before you spend tens of billions of dollars on something that may not be used. And then, you know, you, the, the autonomous technology, what effect is that going to have on, on mobility? Artificial intelligence, what's, are people going to need to commute as much? Are we going to start building assets that we don't need 20 years from now? So those are some of the questions that were part of that uh, National Governors Association initiative that that we talked about. So we're getting to the end here. So let's collect uh, another question and then I think we're probably going to have to finish. Uh oh. A couple of weeks ago, we had the privilege of having uh, outgoing Governor Jerry Brown speak to us. And one of the more insightful questions, which he answered, I think, very well was, you know, what is your most important advice for your incoming successor? What are the things that are very difficult to, to comprehend and to deal with uh, in, in the circumstances they find themselves? Right. No, and again, I, I have great respect for, for Governor Brown, and I'll never forget the first time we met. We were at the Tahoe Forum, and we were sitting in chairs like this, and he leaned over to me and he said, you know, I was governor before. And I said, <laughs> he said, I was, in, I was governor in 1977. And I said, well, you know, I was going into eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. It, you know, it, it was a way to connect. But um, in terms of, um, of, of advice, it, my advice would be to love your state. Um, and to put the people first. I mean, it's it's really hard to do. It, I mean, if if you want to stay in office, a lot of times you've got to go, um, or or you go, you know, with the with the larger group. But but sometimes that's not what's in the best interest of your state. I I preach to the state employees, and I preach to some of these um, younger candidates that public service is a gift. There is no other job that you can have where you can come to go to work every day and make a difference in somebody's life. And if you're there just to stay in office, shame on you. And so you know, we alluded to this. I, I increased the tax in Nevada to fund education because we had the worst high school graduation rate. We had the worst math proficiency. We had the worst reading proficiency and we needed more money for our schools 
In Nevada, you need two-thirds supermajority in order to pass a tax. I had Republican majorities in, in both houses, so I needed to get Republicans to vote for this that could have cost that would cost them and it did cost them some of their political careers but I sat down with them in the governor's mansion and I said to them you know we're not all going to be in public service for the rest of our lives and there's going to be a day when you're going to have a quiet moment and you're going to look back and you're going to remember the hard decisions you're going to remember the decisions that you made that really changed the trajectory of someone's life. Health care, education, helping them get a job, improving their, their quality of life. So that would be my advice to, to the next governor is, you know, sometimes you got to go against your party. Sometimes you have to go against your friends. Sometimes you have to go against the people who contributed to your campaign. And at the end of the day, if it's the right thing, you're going to be okay. I had to do all of those things. And it didn't hurt me. And I come out of office with a very clear conscience and very proud of my record in, in, in changing the state. I don't think I would have felt that way had I not been the first Republican governor to opt in on the Affordable Care Act. I think I would have been ashamed of myself. And I really would have regretted having been the governor of a state and not taking the opportunity to make a difference. So, um, you know, and then the other thing I would say is, um, you know, to really think about things. You know, I had the benefit of being a federal judge be before I was governor, so I'm used to really looking at all the facts and taking into every consideration. In fact, I sometimes I'm criticized in Nevada because they say I'm actually too thoughtful. I don't know. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, to really, you know, don't think about the next term and getting reelected to, to really narrow and isolate those issues and get the best information that you can and then make that, that decision. So that, you know, I hope that's responsive um, to your question. That's one of the reasons, one of the only job that I'm committed to is I'm going to be teaching part-time at the University of Nevada Las Vegas Law School. And I'm going to be teaching a law and leadership class that really is going to focus on the intersection of law, policy, and politics. And hopefully, if I can make an impression on a couple of those students in that class to, to really do what I, what I just described rather than getting sucked into this ideology or partisanship or the next election, then I'll, ha then I'll have been a success. Okay, so join me in thanking the governor for a wonderful session. Let me just make a few uh, acknowledgments. Uh, I want to acknowledge our advisory board members from the Lane Center here, Christy Hope, our vice chair, and John Debs. I want to acknowledge also Jim Augsbury uh, from the Western uh, uh, Governors Association who's been a useful partner for us over these years uh, doing the State of the West. And then I especially want to help uh, uh, thank our co-host, uh, Mark Duggan, and the staff of both the Lane Center and uh, for CEPR uh, who put this event on. Thank you very much. Uh, we really enjoy working with you.